Hello and thank you for the invitation. My name is Lars Vogt. I'm a postdoc at Leibniz Information Center for Science and Technology in Hanover, Germany. And I will talk about boundaries and natural units. We humans, we love to make all kinds of lists. Uh, lists that answer questions about who, when, what, where, how many, uh, and so on. <clears throat> These lists come in different forms. They can come in written forms like this table here, but they can also come in the form of a painting. And again, the painting provides answers to questions of who, when, what, where, how many. Or they can come as a collection of objects. And these collections, they play a central role, a very important role in all kinds of empirical research. And they provide the empirical ground for developing classifications like here, the classification of species based on the classification criterion of uh, common evolutionary history. And these uh, classifications also provide the subject area. They define the subject area and therewith also the area of competence of a research field. And together with the corresponding terminology, they determine the universe of discourse of a research field. And all this is based on inventorying activities. So one can say that inventorying is a central research activity. And inventorying requires partitioning. And partitioning involves identifying and demarcating parts in a whole. This involves uh, this is not always uh, easy. So sometimes you think like, for instance, here, pollen, does that really have parts? But that's often just a matter of resolution. And if you have a high enough resolution, you can see that also pollen consists of uh, clearly identifiable parts. So there are different kinds of partitions that we can distinguish. For instance, here we have Alma and we can distinguish uh, the head, the trunk and the leg. We partition Alma here into different regions, but we could also partition Alma into different objects. We have the tuft, head, trunk, and legs, and these uh, parts can have finer grain parts. <clears throat> so that partitioning can result in what we call granularity trees. So here we have uh, uh, Alma as a whole, and then that we have the first cut of the parts of Alma, which are then called grains, and some of these grains have further grains uh, that then lie in cut number two. And these, the relation between the parts, between the, uh, the different um, layers or levels is a part-whole relation, and we can distinguish three levels of granularity here. And that's then called an instance granularity tree. Now, the question is uh, regarding these two different types of partitions, the region-based and the object-based. Are there criteria for distinguishing natural from artificial granularity trees? Is one of them artificial, the other one um, natural, for instance? And this, these are ideas or questions that have been addressed before. Uh, we see that there are lots of publication about levels of organization or hierarchical schemata that try to provide uh, such a system for uh, all material entities. And one of these, um, a very prominent one is the Eldritch somatic hierarchy. And we see here that different demarcation criteria have been applied. And that's typical for these uh, level uh, schemata. So here the first five levels are more or less defined on structural or physical uh, criteria. And then we have this tissue level, and that's basically just a cluster or an aggregate of cells uh, in a resolution where we cannot distinguish individual cells anymore. And then we have these three layers, uh, organ, organ system, individual organism. These are functionally uh, defined. And that's, that, that uh, results in a category error because just an example, if we take an individual single cell, like a bacterium, that would be an individual organism, but at the same time also a cell. So it would be situated in two different layers at the, or levels at the same time, and that, that doesn't make sense. So an you know, alternative is to look at boundaries and uh, how boundaries can provide demarcation criteria. And uh, boundaries, what are boundaries? Boundaries only uh, 
extended entities possess boundaries. So processes in time or physical objects in space. <clears throat> and these boundaries bound objects of a dimensionality one higher than their own. So a three-dimensional entity is bound by a two-dimensional surface, which is then again bound by a one-dimensional line and so on. That's a mathematical notion of boundary. And from here on, I will focus on physical objects and physical boundaries. And we can distinguish different types of boundaries, like for instance, dynamic boundaries, that uh, where the re uh, location of the boundary is time dependent, like for instance, here in ocean. We can also talk about fuzzy boundaries where uh, boundaries are somewhat weak and non-crisp, like with a dune or an ocean where at a certain point in time, we cannot exactly say where it lies the boundary. So we would rather talk about boundary like regions um, instead of clearly, uh, clearly crisp boundaries. But then this is the, the vagueness is then just a matter of semantics because we cannot just not define uh, correctly where it exactly lies and we can only um, specify this boundary like region. Now, uh, Smith and Varzi uh, have uh, proposed um, uh, two types of boundaries, and with them they distinguish two types of entities, bona fide boundaries and fiat boundaries. And bona fide boundaries they characterize as natural or mind-independent boundaries, which are physical boundaries in the things themselves that exist independently from human perception. And the second criterion, so the, uh, there are two criteria, the, the second criterion is that they can be demarcated on ground of some interior physical discontinuity or some qualitative heterogeneity among the parts of the objects, like for instance, the sharp gradient of mater material constitution, color, texture, and so on. This first criterion is a, a ontological criterion that says natural means real and mind independent. And the second criterion is more an operational criterion and, and a diagnostic criterion that can be practically applied. And that uh, refers to physical properties of discontinuity and heterogeneity. Now, based on this uh, characterization of bona fide boundaries, we can also, they, or they also specify what a bona fide object is. That's an entity with only bona fide outer boundaries. Now, opposed to that, uh, they characterize fiat boundaries and fiat entities. So a fiat boundaries are artificial or mind-dependent boundaries, which are non-physical boundaries that depend on human decision and are thus the products of mental activities, like, for instance, the boundaries of the state Colorado or the boundaries of the heart, where there are ingoing and outgoing vessels. And the second criterion is that fiat boundaries are not grounded in any intrinsic features of the underlying reality and correspond only to cognitive phenomena. So we have again two criteria. The ontological criterion says artificial means mind dependent and the operational criterion says that it only corresponds to cognitive phenomena. And based on that characterization, we can specify that a fiat object part is an entity with at least some fiat outer boundary, like for instance, the human heart that has part of the boundary is bona fide, but also part of the boundary is fiat, and that's why uh, the heart is a fiat object part. Now, this distinction between bona fide boundary and fiat boundary is said to be absolute and categorical which means that there are only these two types of boundaries, no other type of boundary that's exhaustive, this list, and a given boundary can be either bona fide or fiat, but it cannot be both, so it's disjunct. But the question is, is this really a categorical distinction? Now, are the two criteria, the ontological and the operational criterion, really mutually dependent? Let's have a look at the bona fide boundary, the operational criterion. So for instance, an aggregate of cells like we see here. <clears throat> at eyesight scale, we cannot delimit single cells. Instead, 
we refer to the aggregate as a fiat portion of tissue. But then if we use a light or electron microscope, we can delineate and demarcate uh, individual cells. So here they are bona fide objects. So at the cellular and organelle level, it's safe to say they're bona fide objects. But then again, if we look more closely, we see that there are uh, channels and gap junctions in the membrane of a cell so that the inside of the cell is continuous with the outside of the cell. And then it's a fiat object part. Or we take a look at a sheep liver. Uh, at the organ liver le uh, level on eyesight scale, so to speak, we look on the liver and we actually look on epithelia. So it's really clearly demarcated as a bona fide object. But then again, if we look more closely, there are lots of blood vessels going in and out of the liver or bile ducts or nerves. So on a cellular level, we have to say it's a fiat object part. And that's the problem of physical connectedness. At the cellular and supracellular levels, the parts of an, organisms are, of an organism are connected to their neighboring objects via various conduits, tunnels, vessels, and so on. And these connections are characteristic to complex biological systems of interacting subsystems. So they have to be like that. So looking at this uh, operational criterion, we see physical discontinuity that is granularity dependent. Let's have a look at heterogeneity. No two cells are completely identical. And each cell aggregate possesses qualitative heterogeneity between any two adjacent cells. So again, how much heterogeneity is required for bona fide boundary? I don't know. And qualitative heterogeneity seems also to be granularity dependent. So we're dealing with an ontological continuum. Above the molecular level, the distinction of bona fide and fiat boundaries is fuzzy and granularity dependent. So the question, are these two criteria really mutually dependent? Well, I would say no. So the first conclusion that one could draw from that is either there are no natural units above the molecular level or the criteria must be adopted to account for granularity dependence. Another conclusion could be if the two criteria are not mutually dependent, could there be mind independent natural units with physical, physically fiat boundaries like for instance a human heart? Well, every natural unit must meet the ontological criteria. That's clear. The question is, um, every natural unit must meet the operational criterion, which depends on the granular perspective of interest. And so the frame of reference and what are these operational criteria? Well, we know for physical objects, we could use this operational criterion of physical discontinuity and heterogeneity, but we have to be aware that it's granularity dependent. But there may be also other non-structural natural units. And here are some examples from the life sciences. Like for instance, a thigh. If we look at this, uh, is it a structurally bona fide uh, object? Well, looking at the operational criterion, it's, it continues with the trunk, so I would say no. But, um, so structurally it's a fiat object part, but uh, functionally, well, I would say it's a functional uh, unit of locomotion and that independent, it's um, real, it's mind independent. So I would say yes, functionally it's a natural unit, a unit of locomotion. And we can use structural bona fide landmarks to identify it. So the thigh bone with its clear uh, boundaries uh, could be used as land, bona fide landmarks to identify the borders, the boundaries of the uh, locomotion, a uh, unit of locomotion. So, and, and there are different types of uh, functional units that we identify in biology. Units of locomotion, of physiology, ecology, development, reproduction, and propagation. And they're all uh, uh, defined based on or in reference to some universal causality. 
and they use a mixture of bona fide landmarks and dispositions. And we have evolutionary units or historical units like developmental lineages, genealogical lineages, evolutionary lineages. And they are based on a particular causality um, and uh, are defined on common origin. Now, um, probably based on this critique, Smith and colleagues have uh, proposed a new approach for um, identifying natural units. And here they say objects are material entities that exist independent of human partition activities as causally relatively isolated entities that are both structured through and maximal relative to a certain type of causality. So they, the mathematical notion of a boundary is pertained, but the distinction between bona fide and fiat boundaries is completely dropped. All boundaries are considered to be fiat. And they distinguish three types of boundaries. So the first one is causal unity via internal physical forces. The forces are covalent bonds, ionic bonds, and so on. And typical objects would be atoms, molecules, portions of solid matter, and so on. The second criterion would be causal un unity via physical covering. The covering here serves as a barrier between inside and outside, like for instance a biomembrane, and typical objects would be organelles, cells, tissues, and organs. And that's somewhat related to the operational criterion of bona fide boundaries. And then the third one is causal unity via engineered assembly of components, where we have uh, causal unity through screws and glues and so on, and typical objects would be cars, ballpoint pens, houses, and so on. But interesting is here that uh, the second and the third type of causal unity existentially depends and therefore supervenes on causal unity via physical forces. And all three, therefore, probably are associated with the spatial structural frame of reference, which considers reality at a particular point in time, filtering out all the dynamic aspects of reality. So it's synchronic, it's about what is given. And this list of causal unities does not cover all types of natural units identified in the life sciences. So for instance, uh, B cellular eyes, they form functional sensory units and they exist independently of human partition activities. So we suggested another type of causal unity, causal unity via bearing a specific function. And here it unifies an entity through the function that the entity bears with its functional component parts bearing subfunctions. So functional units may lack physical contact connectedness, but they do exhibit functional connectedness. And causal unity via bearing a specific function is there then associated with the functional frame of reference that's more dynamic, predictive, and it's about what can happen. But that's not all. There are, is another type of unity. So for instance, all species of the genus Olaria share a common origin, at least based on this uh, uh, hypothesis of their evolutionary history. They form an evolutionary unit that exists independent of any human partition activity. So we suggested another type of causal unity, causal unity via common historical or evolutionary origin that unifies an, unifies an entity through the common origin of the entity's components. And historical evolutionary units may lack physical connectedness, but they do exhibit historical or evolutionary connectedness. And causal unity via common historical and evolutionary origin is here then associated with a historical or evolutionary frame of reference that's dynamic, it's retrodictive, and it's about what has happened. So coming to the conclusion, Natural units can be ontologically characterized in reference to different types of causal unity. And we can distinguish three different types, categories of natural units, physical, functional, and historical or evolutionary units. And each basic category of natural unit is associated with a corresponding frame of reference. Boundaries 
remain to be important, also because they are relevant in, part, in practical research. To partition an entity into its parts, a researcher needs a diagnostic framework that provides operational criteria for identifying instances of natural units. So in the end, it often depends on identifying some interior physical discontinuity or qualitative heterogeneity among the parts of the object as weak criteria that must be complemented with other criteria and decided on a case-by-case -case basis. That's it. Thank you for your info, uh, attention.